I want to welcome all of you for this, uh, I think, a very, very timely uh, seminar and, and, and effort here in terms of, uh, of sharing intelligence and the like. You may recall some of you uh, older folks at least uh, a couple of years ago, about two and a half years ago, we had a seminar on, uh, on sharing intelligence and combating terrorism and the like, and uh, we looked at that very, very carefully. And, of course, we, we recognized at the time that there was always a you know, a, a principal difference, if you will, between uh, uh, collecting information and intelligence to be used for law enforcement as opposed to using information and intelligence for uh, operations and other activities and the like. And that's because of the legal ramifications. And over the years, they've made considerable progress, in my humble opinion, in, in uh, solving that kind of challenge and the like. And so uh, uh, everybody is operating much better. But more importantly, back uh, in those days, as uh, as Peggy, you would know, and, and others as well, we only had some, you know, some of the uh, the big countries, if you will, that we really shared intelligence with us uh, on, a, on a current uh, a daily basis and the like. And uh, many of the other countries uh, we had some agreements with and this and that, but it wasn't uh, it wasn't standardized, uh, and it didn't, of course, include many of the countries that you have to include today. Uh, since that. Uh, seminar. There's probably been 35 or 36 uh, major kinds of movements to, to share intelligence and the like. And even here uh, recently, uh, uh, a month or so ago, uh, Pakistan and India uh, agreed that they're uh, sharing uh, vital information on certain aspects of intelligence with respect to terrorism and other activities and the like. We have a uh, uh, I think a very, very uh, exceptionally uh, distinguished panel to be with us uh, here today. Uh, there are uh, accurate biographical uh, sketches, if you will, in your package, so I'm not going to belabor that with long introductions and so on, but uh, uh, our first speaker will be uh, Tim Sample, who's uh, been a former staff director of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Uh, he's been a negotiator back in our era together when, on Start One talks with the former Soviet Union and the like, and and uh, and all the various uh, uh, char uh, challenges you had in making sure that both uh, Secretary Schultz and Secretary Weinberger agreed, and that wasn't always easy, was it? Uh, but uh, he's also, of course, uh, served in intelligence units uh, uh, within the government and within the Air Force and special activities. He's been, uh, he's currently the chairman of uh, and CEO of Project 72 in Africa. But more importantly, uh, I can say uh, from personal knowledge that uh, Tim is sort of uh, my kind of guy. He's been extraordinarily effective and he's uh, been a master at getting things done behind the scenes. And uh, as, as, uh, as you veteran Washingtonians know, you can get anything done in Washington you want if you don't care who gets your credit. And Tim is a, a master at that. So, uh, Tim, do you want to take off? Sure. Out there, down here, yeah, yeah, well, anywhere you'd like. Come Your on. pleasure. Yeah. Yeah, just don't I knock over you. my dog. <laughs> I won't knock over the dog. Okay. okay. My wife I, is I won't do that. again, so I have the duty here guarding my teacup <laughs> poodle. It's what's up in the bag. <laughs> and if any of you ladies uh, mention the fact that the former commandant of the Marine Corps has a teacup poodle with pink toenails, we're breaking up forever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, General Gray, thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. Thank you for, for pinch hitting this afternoon. Um, much of what the general started out with is is key and critical uh, to the things that I was going to say, and, and really I have um, five quick points. Um, the first is the obvious. Intel sharing is critical, uh, especially in terms of uh, not just combating terrorism, but preventing terrorism. Um, and I would argue, and, and we'll make this point again later on, we do today a pretty good job at combating terrorism. Uh, the jury, I think, is still out on, quote unquote, preventing terrorism. Not that we have not made Herculean efforts to prevent attacks, but what we haven't had the luxury of doing yet is getting to some of the root causes of today's issues to undercut terrorist organizations like ISIS, 
uh, and and uh, stop uh, them in their tracks, not just with bombs, uh, not just with a message, but with actually uh, disrupting and derailing uh, their pool of recruits. And, and I won't get into that today, but if anybody wants to talk to me about that, especially as it relates to Africa, always happy to share. Um, but the real issue on intel sharing vis-a-vis -vis terrorism is pretty simple. First and foremost is there is no country in this world, including ours, that has the right resources or that has the amount of resources and the right resources to fully engage in this battle. There are countries like the United States who have phenomenal technical resources, uh, the best in the world, I would argue. Um, but we tend to lack, uh, especially since the Cold War, human resource resources to the extent that they can be effective in this particular environment. And consequently, we have to rely on others. And there are many countries around the world who today are much better at it than we are, not in terms of technique necessarily, but certainly in terms of having sources. So it's critical to be able to share information as we go along. Um, the other part to that point is that countries, the, our relationship with countries differ from country to country. Uh, there are some countries that will absolutely refuse on basic principle to share with other countries. Um, there are long histories surrounding that. Uh, that makes things more difficult. That sometimes put us, puts us in the middle uh, of, of, if you will, sharing and or negotiations to share. Uh, that also is not easy, but it is necessary and critical. The second point I would make is that um, intel sharing is hard in any respect. Uh, it requires a level of trust as well as a level of give and take, uh, country to country. And governments often find that hard. Uh, I would argue that Intel entity to Intel entity, it has always been easier. And even today, it's somewhat easier. But uh, government to government, it's hard. And it takes a lot of nurturing and a lot of work. It also primarily in my view, depends on the oversight apparatus for each country. That becomes critical. Uh, Peggy and I have both seen that uh, in spades uh, with our positions on the Hill um, when you had to be very, very careful if you had a visiting legislative body coming to Congress uh, with clearances and talking to them about certain aspects of what's going on. And you have to remind yourself that the House and Senate intelligence committees in the United States by and large have much better and more detailed access to our intelligence operations and apparatus than anybody else in the world. Well, let me rephrase it, than anybody else that has a legislative body. Um, or an effective one. Um, what that means is that you have to, if you're in the legislative uh, uh, branch, be very mindful of where some of the information comes from. Um, I can say this with, uh, with a personal reference in that, in that we had an occasion when um, the British Security and Oversight Committee visited us and I had one member talk about the marvelous uh, job that we, we had in stopping something uh, what didn't happen to be terrorist related uh, but, that, but that something had happened and, and this information was fantastic only to realize uh, uh, that the information we had that we used uh, actually came from the Brits. Uh, and that committee didn't know about it because their level of access was different than ours. Uh, so that makes things um, extremely hard when it comes to how you um, look at oversight and the relationships of intel sharing in terms of who actually has access. Um, and all those rules, as I said, are different. 
My third point, and I think you can't underemphasize this point, is that the actions of Snowden dealt a horrible, horrible blow to Intel sharing. Uh, since that event, if anybody's had an opportunity to talk to Jim Clapper, he would have told you right after the event, and I think even today, that the relationships between intelligence entities, including ones that have been historic uh, and fruitful, have been greatly strained uh, by, this, by Snowden's release. Again, that goes also back to legislatures and everything else, uh, but we can't underestimate the s sensitivity in terms of both willingness and understanding of the dangers now, I will put it that way, of sharing intelligence information, especially when it comes to sources with other governments and other entities. Um, the general pointed out at the beginning, so I won't go deep into this, but there is always a continuous tension between law enforcement intelligence, what I would call national intelligence, not belittling law enforcement intelligence, and actually diplomatic intelligence. Uh, now, you know, I grew up thinking all of it was intel, but I'm going to parse it out for the moment uh, because the axes are different and historically have created hurdles that I think, as, as uh, General Gray said, I think those hurdles are lower than they ever have been. But the fact is, especially when it comes to human sources, there's an issue between providing information and protecting that source for a law enforcement officer who is, who is determined to make an arrest and go to prosecution and another source in which you want to break up something, and that may mean uh, that you are going to use lethal means. Uh, and that, again, is something that we can't underestimate in terms of its complexity and its sensitivity. Um, finally, I believe that even today, though, with all the credit to the intelligence community, to the military, to everybody, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, besmirching anybody, but I think still today we tend to be too tactical. I don't think we have enough resources placed on what I grew up saying was strategic intelligence, um, on the type of intelligence that is estimating what is happening uh, over the next year, two years, five years with some of these organizations. We've, we have never understood ISIS completely in my view. We have a better handle on it today. But while we are in full focus on looking at combating ISIS in the Middle East and obviously in Europe. Uh, I will tell you that today there are ISIS recruiters showing up throughout West and East Africa who are recruiting, not just foot soldiers, but they're putting footholds in because if you go back, they see not just Northern Africa, but also major parts of West and East Africa as part of the caliphate. We have little attention to that, and part of it is understandable. It's, it's the tyranny of the inbox. It's the fact that the Middle East, ISIS, Europe, and our own political elections have sucked all the air out of the room. Um, it's, it's capacity to do that, but that doesn't mean that strategically it is unimportant, and it doesn't mean that we will pay dearly for that if we don't start investing in that type of relationship and in that type of intelligence now. The way to do that, obviously, is to really emphasize and have more robust information sharing, intelligence sharing with many of the countries today, and we have some uh, throughout Africa. And we have that, as I said, in some cases, uh, AFRICOM also uh, is, is engaged in some of this, but we don't tend to emphasize that enough uh, to really get at the, at the root of what's going to happen next. With that, I will end a critical issue, uh, and I look forward to questions later on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next uh, 
Our next speaker uh, doesn't need really any introduction to Potomac Institute. She's one of our senior fellows, uh, as is Tim. And, of course, we're very proud to have her here. And Peggy uh, Evans has had a long and distinguished and really a diversified career in uh, government service, in the private sector, and in the intelligence community. And uh, as a as an intelligence officer with the Central Intelligence Agency for a long, long time, she was uh, well known for uh, her really brilliant uh, uh, analysis and the like, uh, her work supporting covert operations, and uh, more importantly, even in business and later when she worked over in the, in the budget area and when she was with the Department of Defense, uh, in all of these assignments and, and billets, uh, both private and public, uh, uh, one thing stood out, and that was her ability to uh, keep uh, teamwork, to keep people working together, to keep people focused on the issues, and uh, get things done for the good of uh, of our great nation. So, Peggy, would you uh, dazzle us with your footwork here this afternoon, and uh, kind of perk everybody up? <laughs> Tim kind of put them to sleep. So I <laughs> Thank you, General. <laughs> So first, thanks to the Institute and, uh, and to Yona, who I'm sure would have loved to have been here today, put a lot of work into pulling this uh, panel together. And uh, I'm happy to be part of it, particularly given its international flavor and the fact that you know, we recognize that information sharing needs to be done at all levels. So I want to start by saying that Fundamentally, the decision to share information is a policy decision on the part of each party. Framing the policy drives how the information is shared. And while my background, Tim's background, and those of others uh, really focus on the practical elements of sharing in the uh, intel to intel or national security to national security arena, I'm going to say a couple things that are a little bit heretical. Uh, in terms of the roles of different entities in a country or in a region and the, how they can participate and be helpful in information sharing. And I'm going to start by with my first bit of heresy, which is that um, I don't like framing uh, the terrorism issue as a war. I think that that ends up driving people to use military terms like winning or wiping out or destroying. I tend to think of the, the terrorism issue more like a virus. Um, we need to understand it. We need to educate ourselves and others about it. We need to predict the spread of terrorism. We need to interdict it uh, when we can, and we need to contain and respond um, when it occurs. And for me, that analogy really helps me identify the roles of different parts of society in information sharing on the problem. So on the understanding role, um, academia, I think, is a leader here. I think with little to no government role, much of uh, the ideology and the historical bases and the, the demographics um, are all elements of the problem for which the intelligence community does not have a competitive advantage. And I think we need to understand that and not require or expect the resources in the, in the government to take the lead on that. There is, of course, a role with respect to um, uh, AID and USIA, um, but that should pale in comparison to what happens in the civil community. On the education side, I think that peaceful Muslim leaders, community action groups, religious leaders of all faiths, educators, really need to take the lead on education. The more local the effort, the better it is in, at home. And then partnering overseas across nation state borders within those communities can be a very effective way of transmitting not just information, but uh, the dissemination of, of the ideals uh, for which a democratic country stands. Here's, uh, with respect to predicting the spread, I think we can take advantage of our technological <coughs> superiority. Um, again, I don't think this is simply a role for the intelligence community or the national security <coughs> community or the State Department. I think academicians 
have a role here, and I'd like to see our information technology base use some of the techniques that have been used effectively in other arenas, everything from simple gamification where you present problems and provide some sort of notional reward system to get the best minds thinking about how to do things like like model, like simulation, um, and, and present those problems in a way that incentivize our technical talent, not just our government talent, to take on those challenges. The federal government role there could be funding, um, providing grants, uh, to sponsor those activities, but they don't need to occur simply in the government realm. For containing and, and responding as you get closer to the event and the aftermath of the, of the event, that of course is, is where government can and should uh, play the role. And that involves not just cooperation internationally among law enforcement leads with the information that's gleaned uh, and the propagation of uh, lessons learned through all sorts of channels, um, but the, the nature of effective first responding. So what really is the role of intelligence? I stipulate to a lot of what Tim said in terms of the superiority of, uh, or the experience that's been gleaned over the last 30 years, which is when I first became a counterterrorism officer at CIA before counterterrorism was cool. Um, and there were a lot of bureaucratic obstacles to being effective within the organization, let alone across countries. But I would say today where the role of the intelligence community and the national security community uh, has, a, has an advantage and where classified information has an advantage are on things like tradecraft, identities, travel patterns, identification of facilities, and identifying actionable information for the interdiction, prevention, and response to terrorist activity. I think that this type of approach would encourage more engagement um, across countries when it isn't relegated simply to the governments to do so, but where other types of civic organizations are encouraged to participate and to cooperate and to spread uh, messages that are helpful. Um, and I, I take for one example Indonesia, which has a very active role in their um, Muslim community to present to present information and and lessons that are directly contrary to the fundamentalist Islam approach and that type of cooperation internationally I think can make a big difference. Thanks very much. Our next uh, speaker, uh, he, he needs no introduction here either, Dr. Wayne uh, Seidemann, a uh, longtime uh, professional with the Federal Bureau of Investigation in, in uh, several different categories and the like, and has uh, been a legal attache within that framework and has uh, more experience and knowledge than, uh, than the law allows, and we're delighted that he's going to uh, share some of that uh, with us today. Uh, also, of course, the uh, there's a very close relationship with the uh, between the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Marine Corps, and you need to know that. There was a time uh, when the FBI was really good that uh, one out of every eight agents was a Marine, and we had a, a Marine Corps law enforcement, uh, Marine Corps FBI association, as a matter of fact, and then we, uh, we used to have reunions every year. And then uh, uh, on my watch, uh, suddenly they had a little problem up in Fort Stewart at one of the reunions, and so everything was disbanded, but that's another story. But uh, <laughs> and Wayne, will you come up here and, uh, and explain how, how great the FBI is and what we have to do to share things? Thank you. Well, the FBI historically had problems uh, transmitting information, intelligence, even within the FBI. If you, under, if you remember the, the Chinese wall that was created, um, it was where there are both criminal investigations and intelligence investigations on the same subjects. So uh, there had to be, at least the way the Department of Justice and the FBI headquarters interpreted it, there had to be 
uh, an imaginary wall where you had to have criminal agents and intelligence agents, and there were restrictions on sharing information. Uh, a lot of that turned out uh, after 9-11 when they did uh, investigations on that, uh, that a lot of them were self-imposed uh, restrictions and not legal restrictions. So really, there was no reason why they couldn't have been sharing information. Um, also, the FBI traditionally treated terrorism as a criminal matter. So they basically had a saying, it blows up, we show up. So uh, a terrorist attack occurs somewhere in the world. Uh, the FBI dispatches agents to go there uh, investigate, collect evidence, interview people, uh, c come back, provide prosecutive summary reports, um, and uh, take it to the Justice Department, uh, issue indictments, um, and um, then try to uh, prosecute if you can get your hands on the people ever that committed the crimes. The problem with that is that it, would ta it might take two, three years spent on an investigation, a lot of resources, a lot of time, uh, and in the meantime, uh, more terrorist attacks are happening. So there, after 9-11, there, there, there had to be a rethinking, a retooling, where the FBI became more proactive instead of reactive. So instead of re reacting to, to terrorist attacks, it was a matter of uh, f putting the focus on intelligence gathering and being proactive, disrupting, dismantling, and um, uh, so basically um, we wanted to dismantle, disrupt, and um, prevent future terrorist attacks from happening. Um, also, there, there sometimes are competing uh, desires between the law enforcement aspect and the intelligence aspect. For example, um, let's say a terrorist suspect in the East Africa bombings is arrested in another country. It may be, maybe it's Egypt, maybe it's Jordan, maybe it's uh, somewhere else uh, that we have relations with. So the FBI criminal teams may want to extradite the person. We, uh, in my opinion, you have, to, you have to think of it in terms of uh, a holistic approach. If the FBI wants to be able to share information with foreign countries, with the CIA, with the military intelligence, you have to act in, 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 in the manner of intelligence investigations and not criminal. Um, if they're being held in custody in a foreign country, number one, they don't have to give Miranda warnings. They don't have to provide attorneys at that point uh, necessarily. They, um, they basically are, are in a situation where they're willing to provide any information we want that they get from the individual. But they, it's their country, their set of laws that the person is being held under, and uh, for us to interfere with it limits the, the information we can get. Uh, we, we can always provide questions to that to the uh, security and law enforcement and intelligent personnel in that country. Um, now, if you remember the USA Patriot Act after 9-11, uh, they, they changed the FISA requirements, the, that's the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, to indicate that gaining foreign intelligence information is a significant purpose, whereas previously it was the primary purpose. So it's an easier standard to meet. And the, the, inf the, the thing about the FISA as opposed to Title III, uh, Title III investigations, um, you have to show probable cause that a crime occurred, uh, what, what instruments are being used for communication, and who the um, perpetrators are. Whereas for a, for a FISA warrant, all you had to show was a uh, foreign entity or an agent of a foreign power um, conducting intelligence activities. It's a much easier standard to meet, and under FISA, even though it's in gathering intelligence information, if during the course of the um, surveillance uh, evidence of a crime occurs that's, that's compelling, uh, on, with the court permission, the FBI can take that information into a criminal prosecution without it being a Title III. Now, there's a difference between domestic sharing of intelligence and overseas sharing of intelligence. Um, when I was uh, in the legal attache office, uh, actually I was in two of them. One covered Israel, the Palestinian Authority, and Jordan, and the second one 
covered, uh, I was in Jordan, and that covered Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. And when you're overseas, you, the FBI agent, the legal attaché, is wearing a double hat. He works for the, as a director's representative, and he also is, uh, works for the ambassador in the American embassy in that country. So you're co-located in the embassy on a country team. And the country team will have CIA, it will have uh, military personnel, it will have the regional security officers, it'll have various aspects of State Department, whether it's counselor, economic, political. So you're co-located and sharing becomes an easy and efficient matter. You don't have to go through the bureaucratic hurdles of going from headquarters, from, from uh, overseas to headquarters and headquarters to headquarters, and uh, it, it's, it, it can be instant sharing of information. Uh, and um, the important thing, though, is that we have to protect the host country's sources and methods, and we must use the information under the conditions that they provided the information. So sometimes they may give us intelligence information indicating that this is only for intelligence purposes and not to be used in a criminal proceeding or other public pr uh, proceeding. Um, basically, individuals' uh, relationship relationships are important. Uh, a lot of times a um, member of a foreign intelligence service or e another U.S. intelligence service will give you information uh, because they trust you and, uh, and uh, it's an individual one-on-one -on -one relationship, not because it's one agency to another agency. Um, now, domestic sharing is a different matter. Historically, it was a problem. There were stovepipes. Uh, both so within the FBI itself and between the FBI and other agencies. There was the issue of uh, rice bowls, where, where people had their personal fiefdoms. There were what we called bureaucratic speed bumps, people that were risk averse to sharing information. Um, you, have, you had um, inf uh, competitive agency rivalries. Uh, information is power. But that has changed, thankfully, over, over the time and since 9-11. Uh, where uh, we have, in the FBI field offices, we have joint terrorism task forces where we have state police, local police, FBI, INS customs, et cetera. Uh, they're all working together in the same uh, room and, and they can uh, rely on each other uh, for information that is needed for investigations. Um, in, 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 um, in the Washington area, we have Liberty Crossing, which was created where the FBI and the CIA are basically co-located and are in a position where they can easily share information. Um, but, you know, they, historically the CIA was concerned about not having to testify in court, not having to give up sources and methods, and the FBI was concerned about grand jury proceedings because grand jury proceedings are, are uh, private and you have to have uh, authority to release information outside of uh, the, the personnel involved. So. Um, Another thing is, um, with all the um, criticism that uh, Gitmo gets, um, one of the benefits of Gitmo, besides the fact that it took people off the streets and off the battlefields, was that um, it was the, the different agencies, uh, with CIA, FBI, military, were in a position to uh, interrogate the individuals and to share the information amongst the agencies. Um, the host countries don't want the, the people back from Gitmo, uh, which creates a problem. So the difficulty came when uh, the current administration in 2008 uh, came up with their uh, plan to um, both um, eliminate, close down Gitmo, and also to try to make terrorism investigations criminal again as opposed to intelligence investigations. We've seen that 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 plan was not able to be implemented. Uh, I, I assume that um, uh, better minds uh, prevailed and uh, put, some of the, put speed brakes on some of those plans. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. Now, and our next speaker, Mr. Jeffrey Harris, is uh, the deputy head of the European Parliament and liaison office with uh, with our Congress. Formerly, he was head of the Human Rights uh, 
uh, group within the Secretary General of the European Parliament's activities and like. But I think uh, more importantly, we're, uh, we're very fortunate today to have a uh, have a gentleman with us who has a broad experience uh, across uh, many of the issues, the so-called transatlantic issues and the like, many of the issues both uh, with respect to trade as well as uh, business investments, et cetera, et cetera, uh, within uh, the United States and, and the civil groups that, uh, that work those issues, but it, uh, also throughout the European uh, Parliament. And uh, actually, uh, I think it's uh, uh, worthy to note that much of his experience was outside the European Union for quite a while there, where he was really the uh, the chief uh, uh, spokesman on these kind of issues uh, with a lot of countries uh, 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 that were not in the European Union. And of course that speaks to, again, to his uh, his ability to uh, to get along with everybody, to cooperate, to know uh, what the issues are and to be able to articulate them and get things done. So, Jeffrey, if you'll uh, dazzle us with your footwork here, we'd be delighted to, to hear what you have to say. Well, uh, I don't know whether I'll dazzle you, but uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, I've spent uh, almost uh, 40 years as an official of the European Parliament. I'm not quite retired yet, so uh, some of my remarks may be a little guarded. Uh, it so happens that uh, uh, my 66th birthday will be one day before the second referendum in my country about membership of the European Union, as it's now called, so it's a rather strange uh, twist of fate. But an even stranger and more, even more profoundly disturbing twist of fate is what happened in Brussels a few weeks ago, which I'll just briefly uh, tell you about. And of course, it links with a lot of the issues which are being discussed. Literally around the corner from where my two grandsons and their parents live, there were people, they may still be, making suicide vests and then walking into the center, going out to the airport where I've been hundreds of times uh, and causing the mayhem which they had planned. Uh, so uh, these different currents of history have become, have come rather close to my door in, in a pretty disturbing way. So uh, you asked me to look at the broader picture, but these images of Brussels and uh, what might happen in the future there and elsewhere are in my mind. I happened to have been in Boston the day the, the city was locked down looking for the Tsarnaev brothers and having worked on wider European questions, being blocked in the hotel with my wife. I said, I bet I'm the only one in the city who even knows where Chechnya is, apart from obviously in Harvard and places like that. I happened to have been in London, uh, uh, walking across to the House of Commons to meet a friend uh, when I saw up on the screen uh, uh, signs of rubble outside a underground station. I thought, oh dear, there's another bomb in Madrid where my daughter at that time was living, but actually that was around the corner in London too. But of course in Britain uh, we also had a lot of experience, unfortunately, of terrorism during the uh, period of the uh, IRA uh, uh, campaign, which, which has broadly speaking ended, at least the IRA has, but there's still the threat of terrorism there. So sadly we do, even if we're not experts, such as this eminent panel, all have a certain experience of what we are, we are talking about. Uh, and uh, thank you for inviting me again. I was going to begin from a quotation from myself, but my ego is sufficiently limited. I'll, I'll begin with a relevant quotation from somebody I met during my work on human rights, because you might think, uh, in the light of what was being said about Guantanamo, we won't go into that here. Uh, the the the, the what's, what's the head of the, f the former head of the human rights department of the European Parliament doing here? So let's begin with a quote from one of the Sakharov Prize winners of the European Parliament, Malala. Uh, I can't read it with the same uh, verve that she does. She's an outstanding person. I had the honor to meet her a couple of years ago in Strasbourg. She said, with guns, you can kill terrorists. With education, you can kill terrorism. These people weren't born evil or violent. So how do we understand and begin to tackle what happens in the run-up to boarding a plane to Turkey with the aim of reaching Syria? 
Frankly, if some politicians and so-called community leaders in places like Brussels had not placed those questions out of the realm of normal political discourse a few years ago, then we might be in a safer place today. Uh, I mean, we know her to be an exceptional young lady, but as an encapsulation of some of the issues we're talking about, because it's not just uh, counter-terrorism, it's understanding the overall context. Now, the less prestigious quotation is from myself, uh, but I must say, uh, Yona invited me a couple of years ago, it was mentioned, to comment on the European Parliament elections. And uh, we were discussing whether or not uh, Jean-Claude Juncker would re-inspire the European project or whether it was the end of the West as we know it. Uh, these issues, unfortunately, remain, uh, shall we say, unanswered. And I was asked to comment a bit on the European Parliament elections themselves, which maybe is something you know, people don't get so interested in. And I noticed and I remembered and I checked that I said the following. If there is one... <coughs> emblematic event that you had to pick out to understand what is going on in Europe today, you could probably write a novel, a book, a document, or a movie about the tragic shooting near the Jewish Museum in Brussels in May, uh, on the eve of the May 2014 uh, European Parliament elections. That museum, which I know well, I know the guy who set it up, is a couple of miles away where I've worked for many years. The fact that somebody should attack that place was a horrendous act, a horrendous political message. That they should bomb it on the eve of the European elections makes you wonder whether such people are not more aware of what they are trying to tell us than we might ever imagine. The fact that the man arrested for the, uh, the attack is a returnee from Syria reportedly linked to jihadi groups really shows the dimensions of the challenges which we all face, uh, the European Union included. Now, that was just my intuition. Uh, the name of this person has been in the New York Times, uh, Mr. Nemush or somebody, uh, has been frequently mentioned in the Times reports uh, because he was part of the network which then uh, moved on to attack in Paris and then in Brussels. But at the time, uh, somebody asked a Belgian minister, and I'm not blaming, I have no authority to blame anybody, uh, you know, is in this part of some wider plot, you know, surely uh, this person's come from Syria. Oh, no, no, it's just an isolated incident. So then that was almost forgotten. But I remembered it, and now in the light of the arrests in Brussels, as I say, around the streets where, where I've lived for a long time, uh, this case has been revisited, and indeed the Paris bomber who survived and the uh, Brussels bomber of uh, two years ago who also survived um, and he got away in fact he was he was he was picked up uh, are now apparently side by side or one cell next to the other so uh, a certain amount of intuition and I think what, what was said there about the use of academic sources to underlie to analyze what is going on uh, is, is certainly necessary now obviously you are the experts here about you know all issues of connecting different bits of information, how difficult it is in all countries. That's pretty obvious. It's also pretty obvious that the issues we're dealing with are global. Yes, it's Brussels today, but it's uh, in many places in Africa, Australia, the United States, of course, as well. Whether it's a war uh, <coughs> image is the right one to use is really uh, not uh, not one to be to, to, for, for, for me to judge about. But certainly the sharing of intelligence is clearly vital. And I think, contrary to what you might think, uh, the European Union has within the limits of its competences. It's not a union like the United States of America, um, but within its competence, uh, the European Union was well advanced in trying to get to grips with some of these issues well before the Brussels attacks. But what we all need in such circumstances is not just wisdom, anticipation, a vision of society, not only our vision of society, inclusive, free, rule of law, uh, human rights, whatever, but also a vision of the society uh, where such people who would uh, blow us up come from and how they are being manipulated, maybe 
in our society, but in contact uh, with other societies uh, outside of our, our normal geographical uh, uh, area of concentration. And there certainly academic study has a lot uh, to offer, but it certainly requires a much wider vision than just intelligence. But of course, as I said, the human intelligence uh, is absolutely uh, uh, vital. Uh, and But of course, having too much and how you handle it, that's, that's what the professionals uh, have to grapple with every day. I wanted to say that Europe is not quite as asleep uh, as you might uh, think. Uh, I've read articles about Belgium being a failed state, about this being a sign that the European Union is doomed. I can't predict the future, and, and of course, if in such time of concern, uh, the, the, there is reason for anguish in terms of symbolic action. The Malbec metro station is one stop from the Schumann metro station, which happens to be underneath the headquarters of the European Commission. So whatever the story about the original targets, uh, it is perfectly possible that the intention was to blow up underneath the headquarters of the European Union. So a more a clear political message uh, uh, couldn't, be, uh, couldn't have been given. So as I say, Europe is not asleep, has no reason to be asleep after what's happened in, in Madrid, London, Paris, uh, and now in Brussels. Uh, there are, since in the last couple of years, there's been a whole series of initiatives. We have a Europol. Europol has a counter-terrorism center. Uh, but of course, the national intelligence gathering services, they, uh, and local for that matter, they are the ones that do the, 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 the work on the ground. There is not a European Central Intelligence Agency. There is a European arrest warrant. There are attempts to have a common uh, asylum policy. Uh, there are whole issues of how to monitor people traveling within the Schengen zone. Uh, today in the European Parliament, by a very large majority, uh, a, a package of legislation was adopted on the name records for uh, uh, travelers uh, to and from Europe uh, and the United States, as well as uh, an agreement with the United States about uh, data privacy. There has been for many years a sort of anti-radicalization network drawing on academia, social workers, uh, media, uh, you know, to, to monitor the growth of extremism uh, or, or violent extremism as it's as it's called there's a whole internet uh, referral system for monitoring as far as possible what is going on in the internet there's uh, uh, legislation being adopted with regard to the acquisition of firearms uh, to transporting people or objects around Europe with the object of terrorism. So a lot is going on, whether it's too little or too slow. Uh, by definition, uh, it's very, very difficult to judge. But I, I wouldn't think uh, it would be correct to, to for you to go away with the image of, of the European Union sort of either punch drunk or incapable uh, of, of, of acting. There are those who say, well, we've had this terrible wake-up call, now we must have a security union or something like that. Uh, uh, I think these ideas may be good ones, but we're dealing with a very set of immediate issues and new treaties and uh, new uh, political arrangements, uh, which take years to come into effect, even if they ever do, uh, are really not uh, the order of the day. We have uh, also a certain amount of skepticism about the European Union in the air in our public opinion. So another load of, of political integration uh, is perhaps necessary, but unlikely. And the European Union is itself a kind of half-built half house. It is a political union. It has an external action service. It has air embassies. It has ways of, of facilitating cooperation between member states in terms of intelligence uh, gathering. Uh, um, but uh, it is not with its own army and its own uh, secret service. And whether it's a war image you like to use, uh, you could say it's a low-level guerrilla warfare or, or, or whatever, it's certainly the Europeans of all political parties are well aware that we're under uh, attack, not just from terrorists. Also, to some extent, there is some soft and hard power 
being exerted to undermine, if not to frighten, uh, the European uh, Union, uh, that being undertaken by the Russian Federation, where, of course, the role of Russia in Syria in fomenting the whole migration crisis to some extent is being looked at uh, extremely closely. So Europe is not going to, to collapse. It's not going to turn into some other kind of society. As having been brought up in London, uh, it's unimaginable that Britain would turn away from a multicultural society. How you deal with uh, the immigration crisis uh, clearly is, is a really big and controversial political issue, but you're not going to change Paris, you're not going to change London, you're not going to change Brussels, but you're going to have to be more careful about how you govern these cities and how you go about checking uh, on what uh, what people are, are, are doing. So I would say the designs of terrorists is precisely to create panic and to encourage Europe to move away from basic values, the rule of law, respect for different religious groups, uh, 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 and, and to fall into that trap uh, would, would be a, a, a very big mistake. But finally, let me just finish with a quotation from, from the European Parliament. I think, what time is it today? It must have been from yeah, this morning or uh, yeah, this morning in Strasbourg, shall we say, uh, Brussels, uh, Strasbourg time. Uh, the chairman of one of the political groups uh, argued for a long time that it was important to pass legislation on the passenger name records and on the data protection package at the same time. The, and he said, the PNR directive can be a useful tool in the fight against terror. However, despite portrayal of some others, uh, it's not a silver bullet. We won't defeat terrorism with a sort of water gun. First and foremost, uh, we are lacking still uh, automatic and mandatory exchange of PNR data. And most importantly, it will really only be a useful action under the conditions that the member states, the 28 member states of the European Union, realize that there is no other way out than working together to fight back against terrorist threats. So, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jeffrey, very, <coughs> very much. Our next uh, speaker, Mr. Prasad uh, Nalapati, he uh, really it needs no introduction to, at Potomac as well. Uh, he's a longtime uh, friend, longtime associate, and we've always been uh, very, very proud of our relationship with India in matters of national security and, and a cooperative effort and, and, uh, and part of our network, if you will. He's... Uh, He's uh, recently retired as the additional secretary to the government of India and served in the foreign service in, in many, many countries, including Israel, Russia, and the United States. Right now, he's currently the president of the Asia-Africa Policy Research Organization and, uh, and is, I guess, here in the United States for a couple of months uh, to, uh, to uh, help us and uh, to learn a little and, more importantly, teach a little. So if you'll... Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, uh, General, for kind words. Uh, I'm really glad to be here today, which is quite unplanned. Uh, after my retirement, uh, I was trying to just set up my uh, home uh, down south of India. So came on a private visit, then had a word with Yona, and uh, he said, why not come and join our panel today? I said, fine. I said, so, so that's how I'm he here, and uh, I'm sorry to learn that uh, he's not well today. Well, after all, it's always uh, very difficult to be the last speaker after such illustrious speakers here. Um, but uh, I'll try and do as much and uh, add some of the Indian spices to make uh, the event a little more uh, interesting. Well, as we are talking about terrorism, terrorism is a serious business and uh, it's quite traumatic. And even under such traumatic conditions, uh, we, find, we find time for making some fun. So I like to narrate a small joke that I heard often 
during my series of visits to Gaza uh, when I was serving there. Um, the ju joke goes like this. So when a Palestinian mother is ready to deliver a baby, the baby first peeps out a while to make sure that there are no Israeli soldiers around and then comes out. Well, that's what you said, Rizzo. But uh, there's no need to reemphasize the importance of international cooperation in combating terrorism, whether it is in the form of uh, sharing of intelligence, is operational cooperation, or technical assistance. 9-11, uh, in a number of ways, is the watermark in international cooperation in fighting mm -hmm. terrorism. India has been facing terrorism across the from across the border for a long time. The U.S. and its allies in Europe and the Gulf at that time had not only ignored terrorism emanating from across our border, but also tried to cover up in a number of ways. Mr. B. Raman, a former chief of counterterrorism in Indian External Intelligence Service, gave ample examples in his book, Cowboys, on how the evidence given by India to the U.S was deliberately destroyed. Such indirect backing had only exacerbated state-sponsored terrorism as the perpetrators had nothing to fear. But 9-11 had shattered such indifference. International pressure forced governments to act decisively against any form of terrorism. There was greater understanding of what India was going through and consequently, there was dramatic improvement in relations between the U.S. and India. Cooperation in counterterrorism has seen considerable progress with intelligence sharing, information exchange, operational cooperation, counterterrorism technology and equipment. India-U.S. Counterterrorism Cooperation Initiative was signed in 2010 to expand collaboration on counterterrorism and information sharing. A homeland security dialogue was announced during President Obama's visit to India in November 2010 to further deepen operational cooperation and counterterrorism technology transfers. This was re-emphasized during the visit of Prime Minister Modi in 2014. Since then, there has been a regular dialogue on counterterrorism between the State Department and National Affairs Ministry, in which the representatives of the intelligence agencies are also involved. The 2611 Mumbai terror attacks saw the two countries work closely and identify the perpetrators and their hand, elite handlers in Pakistan. However, I must point that there were missed opportunities which could have helped prevent these attacks. David Coleman Hadley was the one who did the recce and record topographical pictures of the Mumbai targets, which were later used by the Lashkare Taiba operatives to attack. Hadley was also an agent of US domestic agencies who were aware of his regular visits to Pakistan and India. Had he been questioned and his movements shared with India, Mumbai attacks perhaps could have been averted. Despite initial resistance, it is now heartening to see that the U.S. is giving increased access to Indian agencies to question Hadley. There is similar improvement in counterterrorism cooperation and intelligence sharing uh, with uh, Gulf countries like UAE and Saudi Arabia, who had earlier sheltered several of India wanted terrorists. The UAE has deported a number of terror operatives and Islamic State radicalized youth to India. Recently, Saudi Arabia sent to India a terror suspect who was said to be plotting to attack against India. Since the repatriation of uh, Abu Jihad in 2012, who was involved in Mumbai attacks, who was there in the control room in Karachi. Since then, Kara Saudi Arabia appears to be showing more willingness to cooperate with India. Recent visits by Prime Minister Modi to these two countries further cemented this cooperation on countering terrorism and sharing intelligence. 
Well, there are, however, uh, limits to such cooperation. While many known and unknown terrorist elements are targeted for aerial raids in many theaters, including AFPA, most wanted terrorist leaders like Hafiz al Said of Lashkar e Taiba, Maulana Masood Azhar of Jaish e Muhammad, they are openly roaming around propagating jihad. Although to the two organizations are banned terrorist groups, and Syed himself carries an American bounty of $10 million on his head, they do not seem to fear. China even protects Azhar from being included in the UN terrorist list under the cover of technical hold. So what I'm trying to say is some nations follow a policy of good and bad terrorists. As long as these duplicitous policies continue, it is difficult to see how terrorism can be countered effectively. Middle East theater is also truly suffering from this good and bad terror syndrome. Some regional countries supported various terrorist groups. However, of late, Russia-US cooperation in Syria is proving to be highly effective. It resulted in increased intelligence sharing and coordinated bombing of the ISIS and al-Nusra strongholds. It led to UN-sponsored peace negotiations, this is a selecting right groups for negotiations and targeting other terror outfits, pressuring on Saudi, pressure on Saudi Arabia and Turkey to keep off sponsoring terror groups. So other, there are several measures now that can help us to further such cooperation. Russia-US cooperation may be expanded to other theaters as well, such as Yemen, Iraq, Libya, for more meaningful way of tackling terrorism. States practicing good and bad terrorism must be pressured to give up using terror as means of their foreign policy. UN shall be empowered to create negative consequences against those practicing terrorism to promote their interests. Of course, regular dialogue among nations, both bilateral, regional, and multinational levels could help better understand and counter terrorism in all forms. India has such dialogue with several countries which I mentioned, including Pakistan and China. As General mentioned that uh, we had an increased uh, interaction and cooperation with Pakistan to share intelligence. And uh, in fact, uh, the Pakistani team came to Patan Court recently to investigate the recent attack from Jaish e Muhammad. So, mm, the intelligence sharing, of course, uh, is, a, is a difficult uh, uh, area unless you have faith and trust in each other, um, which takes a long time, and you have to have the uh, uh, same mindset. Um, sometimes you, there's a partial sharing, which is uh, equally dangerous, such as in the case of uh, Mumbai attacks and uh, David Coleman Hadley. Uh, there are reasons, of course, for different countries uh, to avoid sharing because uh, exposure of sources uh, could lead to the drying of their intelligence uh, collection methods, measures. So within the limits that we have, I think uh, there should be greater mechanism and greater dialogue among countries so that uh, the level of confidence can be built up so that would help sharing more intelligence. So I think that's the only way to fight the counterterrorism. Thank you for this opportunity, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. All right. We'd, uh, now I'd like to open it up for questions from, uh, from the audience for our panels, and I would uh, uh, politely remind you to uh, Please don't make a speech. Just ask the question. Uh, Yona is much more forgiving than I am on that topic. So, and uh, here comes wait, wait, here comes the mic. So, uh, I'm Colin Ag from uh, Army G2 in the Pentagon. Um, I'll direct this at Peggy, but for any of the uh, panel, I was struck by uh, you highlighting the term actionable, which obviously is near and dear to the Army's heart, and we had a whole. Our whole transformation effort was called actionable intelligence. 
Uh, but it seems there, if we look at some of the contemporary events we're dealing with, um, the Ukraine, Syria, ISIS, they've all been variously characterized as intelligence failures. But, but they're not surprises anymore, and yet we seem to not really know what we want to do. So I wonder if you could comment on the interplay between intelligence and strategy and policy, and what's really actionable if we don't know what we want to do with the intelligence that we have. Well, there's a lot there, isn't there? <laughs> um, I think the nature of actionable intelligence can be overstated. broader the movement, the more uh, grassroots based the movement is, the harder it will be to anticipate a specific action. And one of the things the intelligence community gets blamed for a lot is the, is not seeing the Arab Spring coming. And I think that's, that's an example of where uh, nobody could have predict, predicted a single food stand owner setting himself on fire at a particular point in time. similar uh, uh, concerns across the region. So for me, the policy is understand is understanding what is happening in these countries. Uh, my personal opinion is the State Department focuses too much on government-to-government -government relationships and doesn't really get out and understand what's happening on the ground uh, in a way that allows for more sophisticated guidance for strategy and Tim, you want to add anything? Yeah, I'll add a, a couple quick things. Uh, first, emphasizing what Peggy said in her remarks is, is at the end of the day, it, it is a policy decision. Um, you know, I, I, a lot of my focus over the last 18 months has been Africa. Um, I, I will, and going to, to Peggy's last point, I'm going to make uh, two additional points. The first is, I sit here today with a significant amount of information and access to what's happening on the ground in a country like Ghana. You talk to most people and most, most governments, and Ghana, great place, you know, stable, always will be. Democratic, you know, government, not a problem. And we have been spending the last six months trying to dissuade our own government of that attitude. Not that there is something wrong with the Ghanaian government, but there are many things, not just the ISIS example, but other things that are happening on the ground that we are not paying attention to, but that all create an environment ripe for radicalization by the hundreds of millions of um, African youth who are now becoming of employment age and will over the next 10 years and have no hope and have no opportunity because of the current economic conditions. And we can't seem, the State Department can't seem to fully understand and appreciate why that leads to the potential for terrorism, the potential for you know a shaky government, for disrupting November elections in Ghana and that type of thing. So it, it, it is, again, it goes back to the strategic aspect. And one other thing I'd add very quickly is that Peggy talked about academia. I'll also talk in the same breath about a variety of funding organizations, uh, both private and, and government, uh, uh, that work with NGOs. And if you go, and I 
now have personal experience with this, if you take the same example I talked about, Donna, and you have an opportunity to, to get in and do something to prevent some of this from happening, what you find is almost all of our major foundations and funding organizations have become so bureaucratized and so focused on ending poverty and, and you know, at, pick your major worldwide horrible topic that they can no longer fundamentally react to early warning signs that would allow you to prevent the establishment of radicalization and violent, uh, violent conflict. And it's, it's a real long-term problem for the U.S. and I think for the West in general. Okay. Thank you, Janelle. Hello? You hear me? Okay. Thank you very much. My name is Antonio Nascimento. I came from the Embassy of Cabo Verde. Uh, and um, first of all, thank you for invi inviting us to this uh, very important uh, sharing. Um, I, did I really appreciated what we heard here about the, the, the problems of intelligence uh, uh, sharing between countries and between services. Uh, in my uh, small experience, we, I spent last eight years trying to create a small intelligence service in Cabo Verde, in my countries, country where we face really uh, some challenges, as you, you may know. And one of the problems that I want to, to touch here, how could we overcome this problem of sharing, in fact? It means the big countries, the big services that really have good intelligence or, or at least can generate good intelligence. Sometimes, and I personally understand, they do have difficulties in sharing. We, we do understand. I will not share my intelligence with whom I don't trust or with whom I'm, I have no confidence that they can protect that intelligence or it can, or it can go to the wrong hands. I understand that. But if we look at the region li like West Africa, I'm talking about my region, where I'm, the Cap Cap Verde are small islands in front, and so we, we face the same problems that all the region suffers today. W whether we talk about urbanized crime, w we talk about narco-traffic, we talk, talk about terrorism. We are neighbor with Boko Haram, we are neighbor with Mujau, we are neighbor with uh, many other problems. And in such countries, generate intelligence is a big problem. It means, I will bring the example of my country. We, we did good steps forward in terms of creating a police, uh, trying to, to organize the border, but we still member of ECOWAS, for example. ECOWAS is a free movement among th 15 countries in the, in, the, in the region. Just to give you a practical example that uh, we had in the past, if some person comes from Somalia, from Eritrea, goes to Guinea-Bissau, Senegal, or other country, by acquire illegally a passport of ECOWAS, can freely enter in Cabo Verde, for example. And we know the, f the vulnerabilities of the, the act. So what the point is, in such countries, very vulnerable, I'm talking about Cabo Verde, you mentioned Ghana, you can mention Guinea-Bissau, Senegal, any other country is the same. The risk uh, is the same. We are suffering uh, a s a, an asymmetric challenge, and we are in the dead end. It means, from one side, we don't get good intelligence. We are not able to to generate and create good intelligence, I mean, I mean in, a, in a global way, from one side. From other side, we have no means to, to, to detect. That's the, the example again of my country. We, are, we try to develop tourism. You, you all know the organizations like Tablik Jamaat, for example. No? Tablik is not a tourist. Uh, organization. We cannot consider them like a tourist organization, but we do take care on their movements. Yeah, we know that. 
So if they come to our counters and they realize that perhaps we are paying attention, next time they come in a charter flight from Belgium, from Netherlands, from France, they go directly to the tourist islands. So when we realize they are there on the islands moving, of course they are doing their proselytism. They are not committing crime. This is another kind of vulnerability. It means if we don't pass this circle of uh, we don't share substantial intelligence because we are not sure if our partner will protect that intelligence properly from other side, how could we expect that that country can really and effectively combat terrorism without substantial intelligence? Just to finish, another point that you, uh, Mr. Timothy uh, Sample, you mentioned that is absolutely right and important, and, and uh, what is happening. Uh, Miss even said that with gun we can combat, we can uh, kill a terrorist. With education, we can combat terrorism. Sometimes our government do not look uh, to the root cause of the problems. If we don't understand uh, the the individual, <coughs> yes, <laughs> I'm finishing. The the individual uh, uh, frustration the community frustration, the problems in the, in the community, it's very easy target for organizations that come with help with their ideology, and this is really a big problem that we face in such things. Thank you very much, and I'm so sorry to be quite long. Tim, you have any comments on that? Yeah, actually, I, I, it is a difficult situation. And, and there's not a easy answer. I will say that if you look at our own history, including even the issue of intel sharing within our own government, within our own intelligence organizations, a key is to, and it's hard to do, a key is to find and cultivate a personal relationship with a counterpart in another country. Somebody that you can create a level of trust. There are risks. Right. But it's always a good way to start. Because at the end of the day, it's the ability to pick up a phone and know who you're talking to and know you can trust them and say, ha, we need help, this is what we think's happening, that, that wins this fight, hands down. Any of the other panel members like to comment? All right. I'll make uh, just one oh, brief go ahead, comment, Peg. and that is that I think we do grossly overclassify our country. No, and that to the degree that we rely, we base our classification system on how the information was obtained, rather than whether that information could have been obtained in any number of ways, ensures that we overclassify. So that doesn't help you, but I think it's something that we um, uh, have to examine among ourselves and with our, our allies in determining whether we really are addressing the international concern uh, effectively when we continue to overclassify. We get information mixed up with intelligence. Mm -hmm. I agree with uh, what Tim said about the, <coughs> the fact that you have to cultivate, cultivate individual relationships. That, that's all, whether it's with a foreign intelligence service, whether it's with, within your own country, you, you have to go in little st incremental steps in order to gain trust and credibility. And if you develop this relationship and, you know, the, and the, the information is used in the proper way, uh, you'll see that it'll, it'll increase and it'll become more and more information and, and you'll get a reputation, intelligence service, of anyone that, that can be trusted and relied on. Um, I'm the defense attache of Pakistan um, from the embassy of Pakistan. Uh, first of all, my compliments to the panel for such a wonderful presentation. It's very instructive for me being a professional. Uh, I also realize, uh, I won't make a long comment, but my view is that uh, the need for intelligence share sharing arises from the mere fact that the terrorists are nobody's friend. So all countries need to share the intelligence to work against a threat that is common to all. Uh, but 
Uh, I would just like to comment upon and ask a question from Mr. Nanapati, uh, where he, instead of intelligence sharing, uh, focuses talking about bashing on Pakistan. But how would you behave, uh, uh, how would you uh, characterize a state behavior where the state sponsored terrorists like Sarabjit Singh are given the state funerals, or where the serving intelligence officers of India are caught in Balochistan doing the terrorist activity? And so uh, I think we need to first overcome with own state obsessions to be able to effectively work against uh, such a menace that is nobody's friend. Thank you, General. Um, well, <coughs> the question about Sarabjit or uh, the current uh, so-called naval officer. So this is your uh, claims. <coughs> and uh, I think Government of India has responded. And this is only the latest thing that you mentioned was uh, basically this uh, captivity, the person uh, in captivity telling something in camera. So it, one has to investigate further what happened. Um, so as far as Government of India policy, I'm very sure. And I'm part of the government, so I can say with definite terms that India doesn't promote. And second, India recognizes the importance of talking to Pakistan and sharing intelligence with Pakistan of late. So on lashkar e taiba a lot of intelligence was provided uh, to help to try those uh, uh, LET culprits who were arrested. So in the latest case, also on Jaysh e Mohammed, so we shared uh, a lot of intelligence. And in fact, so the Pakistani courts uh, ordered to send an investigating team to the army base and uh, discuss with all the people who are there. This was all given. So there is an amount of uh, cooperation, effort to deal with this situation in a more uh, uh, present manner and more through the dialogue. Uh, that's what I said in Michigan, that, that dialogue bilaterally, regionally, and multilaterally is important to understand what you have in mind and uh, to discuss more openly what is it all about and deal with that situation. So uh, if, if you are saying that India is sponsoring certain things, but that, you, that I must say that you are claims. That that's not substantiated anywhere. Um, there are a lot of. Happen. If it's happening, it should not happen. Uh, absolutely, of course. I, I'm saying that India sh will not do. India has not done. So that's my po point. So, thank you. Any other panelists want to comment? Okay, next. Well, you go. Whoops. <laughs> You're next. Hang in there. Thank you. Um, my name is Ron Taylor. I'm with the George Washington University. I'm a senior, senior fellow at George Washington University. So um, I guess I was thinking about Africa there. And, you know, one part of sort of the true state of Africa is that should make us nervous in this country is the fact that there are a number of immigrants going, you know, I just see flow lines and pictures just leaving Africa and going, going to South America, whether they land in, in Venezuela or Colombia and making their way up through Central America and trying to make their way right in through Mexico. So, you know, right there is an argument I think would be uh, useful to, uh, you know, help give the impression that we have a problem. Africa has a problem. We have a problem. They're connected. And I say that, and, and twice I use the word intentionally, Truthful, you know. I didn't use the word trust yet, but you know, two two of the bases for making any headway against something like terrorism are trust and truth. And you know, I'll I'll just draw on a quote and so kind of stop at that. But it's a quote I try and try and use, and it always helps me when I'm trying to figure out what intelligence, information, evidence, data, knowledge, which these things are, and which useful and what's not. So it's a quote from Einstein, and this guy had a lot of experience with governments, you know, operations, all this stuff, you know, people, academics. And uh, the quote is, the right to search for truth implies also a duty. One must not conceal any part of what one has recognized to be true. So not in the Snowden way or the WikiLeaks way, but, you know, in sort of an absolute sharing of truth. So when I think about sharing intelligence or the rest of it, you know, I don't think about 
sharing intelligence in the classic sense, I think about sharing truth. You know, what do we really know? What's really true? And, you know, I think that would be a better way to kind of uh, go about, you know, breaking the code on counterterrorism. And, you know, General Mathis has put it out there, you know, the age of the future now is an age where people should be thinking in terms of, you know, when do you know something? That something should be, when do I know something to be true? Uh, once I know it, I should decide immediately who needs to know it, because it's not my information, it's not my truth anymore. I gotta tell somebody, and together you gotta figure out what you do as an action. And so that's the age we're in, and it's, that's a faster age, and policy, all the rest of it is very slow. I, you know, so what are your thoughts about that? So I guess my position on that is uh, terrorism is is a, a Swiss cheese where the holes are bigger than the cheese, right? So being able to identify truth, being able to say what is is absolutely true is very, very difficult in this realm. To the degree that you're talking about, you know, what is, what does someone believe, what is someone prepared to do? Um, I would I contend that that can be highly idiosyncratic, and from moment to moment, you can't know what a specific individual or a group is planning to do. So, because I was an intelligence professional, I do think in actionable terms. And to me, trying to identify what is wholly truthful is is more important in understanding what a, a people want to do or a movement wants to do or a religion wants to do, as opposed to what a specific individual or a small cell group is going to do. The dearth of information far outweighs the availability of information. But you have, but you have at, your, you know, at your fingertips now a whole new forefront in the development in neurosciences, cognitive sciences, things like that, that you can use in the way of tools to help you with that, to help you anticipate you know, what individual people, individual cells, individual groups uh, you know, are intended to have the technologies, but that, that doesn't mean, science also. Right, look, look I, I have a theory that I, that I won't go through, I will give you the, 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 the punchline. We are, we are some, we are, we are the best in the world at most technologies, but we also continue, continue to fail technology on a regular basis. Um, our policies are always behind. Our decision on how to use technology is some is often in question, um, and and often that that ability to use technology um, goes to a very tactical and immediate response rather than a long term approach. But I will say, um, going to the question of truth, and, I, and I'll agree with Peggy very quickly. If you remember after after 9/11, one of the biggest things that came out in the media, and it actually came from the Hill. One of the biggest things that came out is the intelligence community you know, failed to connect the dots. For a decade, that's been the big thing. Oh, connect the dots, connect the dots. I, w I subscribe to my good friend Mark Lowenthal's theory. I don't want the intelligence community con to connect dots. Three-year-olds connect dots. I want an intelligence community that can come up with a reasonable and logical risk assessment and an assessment of what may happen when dots are not present. So while I don't disagree with the issue of truth per se, I think that it is not, I, I think that it is a very hard measure to rely on, especially in the absence of dots. I, I, I think you can get hooked on it, and I, I guess is my concern. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Milton Honig, uh, what can we be told uh, in connection with the uh, you know, ISIS-related attacks in France and Belgium about intelligence sharing that might have taken place between the U.S. and 
France and Belgium. Well, what do you know about that? What is it that we can say actually occurred, if anything? I would not comment on any intel to intel sharing, even if I knew. Unless it's already been made public, I defer to the regional expert, but. And I think the short answer is uh, it's a little bit what you were saying. I mean, a lot of information is out there. A careful reading of the newspaper will give you a lot of information about information shared between <coughs> Turkey, Belgium, US, France, Belgium. So I don't think we can really answer any more than that. Uh, as has happened in the most of those uh, cases, uh, uh, not knowing where exactly something was going to happen. As I said in my own presentation, there was perfect awareness that something was going to happen, but where exactly was impossible to work out. And in retrospect, maybe uh, some of those things could have been uh, uh, identified in advance. But uh, the kind of question you're put is answered by a careful reading of the newspaper, since I have absolutely no access to any kind of information beyond that myself. Lady here had a question. She was too shy to. Hey, uh, Jennifer Palato with the Potomac Institute. So I wanted to shift the focus to domestic intelligence sharing and come back to this issue of policy. So I guess this is mainly for Peggy and Tim. Do we need to amend existing legislation, such as the IRTPA, or do we need entirely new policy mandates to continue to improve intelligence information sharing across the board? Are you referring to intelligence agencies and law enforcement authorities uh, <coughs> providing information to each other? Uh, and more so just the national intelligence itself. Well, I think, if, I think to the degree that there's a problem with information sharing among intelligence agencies, uh, that it is as much a um, technology and infrastructure problem as as it is a, a policy problem or a, or a authorities problem. I think General Clapper has been very open and public about his desire to see um, intelligence integration across the intelligence community and all the way down through every agency that has a role to play, um, whether it's it's DHS or Treasury or DEA. Uh, let alone the you know the big agencies like the bureau and uh, and the mainline intel agencies. So I don't think there's a problem to the degree that there's a lot of discussion and debate. It has to do with um, privacy issues, and I will I will always give NSA a lot of credit for the efforts that they have made and the tremendous investments that they've made culturally in ensuring that U.S. person information is is protected uh, with regard to the intelligence mission. And I would defer to my bureau colleague to discuss how that works in the law enforcement area. Well, <coughs> the FBI has a lot of problems with uh, computers, as, as has been publicly known. Uh, they're probably 20 years, they're probably 20 years behind uh, what the corporate and uh, other intelligence agencies had. Um, they've been trying to improve think that there should be, like Peggy mentioned, an integration. Um, <coughs> so because every every agency, the CIA has their uh, system, the military has their system, the FBI has their system, and and while intelligence analysts uh, and operators do have access to the different databases, it, it's cumbersome. You, you know, if, you, if you're making an inquiry, you have to go to all these different uh, databases, whereas if it was integrated into one system, uh, it would be a lot I also think there's one, one aspect that we need to keep in mind, and I agree with, with uh, the comments that have just been made. Uh, the other aspect to this is we're in a different place than we are than we were when that legislation was, was invoked. I mean, one of the issues, one of the biggest issues that nobody talks about is that, um, I've got to say this in a way that doesn't try to disparage local law enforcement because I'm a huge fan. But the, but the fact is one of the biggest issues that has been overcome is not just intel sharing, but an education of local 
law enforcement on what to expect. I remember post 9-11 where I would talk to, to uh, county sheriffs and, and, and uh, any pick your local law enforcement person and their view was if I only had a clearance then everything would be clear. You know, if I had that clearance the sun's going to come out all the terrorist you know, bodies in the United States are going to be laid at my feet, and all I'll have to do is monitor them and pick them up. And 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 wow, were they in for a shock? Um, so I so I think, you know, the points that have been made about technology are exactly right. But when a lot of that legislation was done, it was it was a it was worthwhile. But part of the motivation for that was a little misguided in that it was kind of how do we force feed local law enforcement because they feel like they've been kept out and now 9-11 has, has said, oh, I gotta have this stuff. Because there was a whole period, it was a whole two year period after 9-11 where you would interview local law enforcement and they would go, oh yeah, I got it, but man, it's, I don't know what to do with it. You know, you'd hear these complaints, oh, DHS is sharing, but it, it's not actionable. It doesn't give me anything. Well, guess what? Welcome to the big world of intelligence. I mean, you know, most of the time, that's kind of where you are. Um, so I, I think there's been a big improvement in in understanding by local law enforcement across the board in what to expect and how to interact. It has been very beneficial for, for the U.S. intelligence organization. I agree with, with what you said. I would just add to that that the, the state and local uh, police uh, can be a, a great tool you bet. Uh, because they're the eyes and ears. They're the mm -hmm. ones that are out in the streets, yep. whereas in the FBI there may be 12,000. I'm not sure what the reasonable agents, yep. but you know, and they can't cover everything. But if you have the police educated and on board and, and, and effective liaison, uh, they can go a lot of good. Uh, Professor Don Wallace uh, from the International Law Institute has uh, been our partner in all these activities for a million years and he's been uh, head of that outfit since 1970 and I, uh, I'd like to ask him to make some comments because I think he has to leave a little early. Thank you very much, General. Can you hear me? Yes. You know, it's an odd partnership. They know everything, we know almost nothing. I'm sorry Yona's not here because he organized the panel. You know, um, I'm just I'm going to speak as a citizen because I have none of the expertise. Uh, sharing intelligence, I think actually a rather good job is being done, no matter how you define intelligence. I think the Europeans, I think this program is probably organized because of what happened in, in Paris and Brussels. I think the Europeans can learn a fair amount from the United States, from the FBI samples and evidence have said because we've gone through this battle in a very different society and in Europe they have to organize within each country and across the borders. But, you know, I think what we should be sharing is something other than intelligence. This is going to sound very professorial. <laughs> Wisdom, knowledge, and stoicism. Stoicism, for one thing. I mean, terrorism is a problem. Iona has been at this for years, defining it, you know, the use of the threat of force to change political. It's gotten broader than that. You know, it's not clear that San Bernardino was concocted in Raqqa. Um, uh, stoicism, my wife's a Brit. They have it there in the past, been very stoic. We're not stoic enough. This is why Donald Trump and the others trade on our fears. And I, there I res I'm a Republican, but I respect Obama tremendously because he really always has remained calm. But I think this is going to be ultimately crucial. This is asymmetric activity. I won't use the word warfare, as was mentioned by the gentleman from Cabo Verde, because they just have to hit once and we panic, whereas we have to hit thousands. Hit's the wrong word. We're not going to be able to do it. Uh, Malala, that great woman mentioned by Mr. Harris. Uh, yes, I mean, obviously, um, this, is not a, this, is, this is not the Cold War. This is not even the not Cold War. It's a totally different thing. You know, intellectuals talk about things like the Dutch cartoons, the French laicism, which infuriates the Muslims. Uh, I won't even attack 2003. So you're talking about a profound phenomenon. I mentioned stoicism. Knowledge. What do we know about ISIS? Because we're typically talking about the Middle East and Islam. What do we know about its vision? They have a vision, and they know how to manipulate people who don't have a vision. And you're talking about thousands and thousands of kids. You know, we know all kinds of, we all have children and grandchildren. 
so on turn out okay. Um, so I mean, I think it's so much broader than anything we've ever conceived in the past. Reference was made to academia, civil society. They were also just dots in the sea, you know? It, it's really more of a question of how the society herds cats, how the society, we pull ourselves together to deal with everything as intelligent as we can, and we're gonna lose some. I, um, I think it's probably all I really want to say. Um, but I, you know, I, 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 I've, I've sat through many of these panels, including with Wayne and others, Mr. Harris. Um, and at least one thing I've seen today, which sometimes I think we lack, is respect for ourselves. I think the US has done a very good job. And it can only do as well as it can do. Um, and I think that's about it. I mean, I think, uh, I really do think this is gonna be a case of uh, just really educating ourselves about everything in a way and, and just uh, going forward with the kind of drive and determination and optimism that General Gray has always shown. I'm not sure I would turn the Marines onto this problem, <laughs> but I would certainly turn the attitude of the Marines onto the problem, which is, you know, you just keep fighting. You're gonna lose some, just keep at it. Don't be too cynical about yourself and I, and I think we'll, we'll do as well as, as we can go do and that's all there's to it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Here comes the mic. Yeah, wait till the mic. Yeah, there you go. Good afternoon, everybody. I am General Lasprilla, Colombian Defense Attaché. It's a really an honor for me to be here. Uh, I would like to to have some comments in, in under those comments, uh, a couple of questions. Understanding that ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and some of these uh, terrorist groups are a network, asymmetric, and m much more today, transnational organized crime organizations because they have uh, communications, they also have illegal funds uh, as we in Colombia treat for many years to illegal groups that you uh, very understand. We think that uh, a strategy or we design a strategy against a strategy to face those emerging threats. Terms of sovereignty and independence are not absolutely today due to the globalization of politics, economy, communications, and these uh, uh, terrorist groups uh, impact. I think those terms have to be reevaluated. We know that uh, for many years, aspects as defense and security has been treated separately and, uh, and has been sensitive. And maybe to be more holistic in how we see and how we treat this phenomenon, and for better law enforcement and interoperability, I think we have to focus and analyze how these elements, which are important for all countries, uh, can uh, be analyzed because we think that uh, these are part of the gas of, and part of the gray zones that uh, act as an obstacle for the development of a policy, a policy that guidelines and strategy, and also the strategy that drive, especially what we do in, in the ground. That's one of the comments and of the question, and the other, we need time to develop a strategy. And sometimes we look at numbers more in capability. 
and sometimes we uh, focus more in uh, strategic levels and policies than in what we need to implement in the ground. I think for better uh, behavior and for better uh, effectiveness in uh, the tactic level, in, in this level, we have to focus on these terms that I have mentioned now. Um, so uh, there are a couple things that I took away from, from that discussion um, that resonated with me as a former counterterrorism officer. One is the, the nature of the interaction between international crime and a, a terrorism or other uh, kind of transnational movement. And in this country, I have been very admiring of the relationship between the intelligence community and the law enforcement community in identifying where criminal elements, or where crimes have been committed to fund <coughs> these types of efforts. I think that's, understanding that nexus is very important in trying to break down um, uh, terrorist capability. The second point uh, that you made about differentiating between security and defense, in this country that is a rock solid wall, right? Because of Posse Comitatus, uh, it has long been a fundamental tenet of our culture that the military uh, is under civilian command authority and that it's not to involve itself in law enforcement. Law enforcement is its own community, its own discipline, its own trade craft, its own authorities. Um, it, in our culture and in our country, it is absolutely critical that those two things be completely separate. <laughs> okay, if I can make a quick comment. Not having enough focus on the ground and tactically is a mistake. You have to, but 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 you have to find that balance between strategic and tactical, right? I mean, you, you spend a lot. Of government might spend a lot of time on a strategy, and and uh, there are a myriad of defense companies around the Beltway here in D.C who spend countless of hours on strategies and then have no idea what to do with them. Um, the, the strategy is a living document. It is something that guides you but is always manipulated and changed as events on the ground uh, uh, bring about new realities. And the same is true, I think, in this case, that having an overall guiding strategy is important. Having the ability to continue to change that because you have that interaction and input on the ground uh, becomes, uh, becomes huge. The second point I would make is um, a, a lot of this also, it goes to, goes to something you said and also something you said, uh, personal relationships in that whole spectrum, right, become huge. Um, um, when it comes to the, the international crime aspect of it, if, if I'm going to plug one of Yona's uh, publications here, if you have it's in your in your packet, but if you if you do not have this, figure out how to get it. I'm sure you can go on the website or something. Um, but in there, and Yona and I talk about this a lot. There is a map that Yona has used for a long time about North Africa, and we have labeled this the Arc of Instability. And it's not because of terrorism. It's because the confluence of um, narcotics, human trafficking, money laundering, and terrorism uh, that all have come together into this arc of instability. And what I look at is, my, and I already told Yona, he's got to redraw his line because the arc is starting to widen, not shrink. And that's, the pro and that's part of the problem. Um, but going, going to uh, the issue of interaction, let me make, uh, and I'll, in general, I'll keep this as short as I can. Uh, um, one oh. of the issues that I've always, that, that has meant so much to me, is actually a conversation that I had on a congressional delegation on ten, nine days before 9-11, when in fact I was in Pakistan. 
and it was a conversation with then President Mashad, and I, this will just stay with me forever. And in that conversation, we talked about he, his point was why some of the sanctions the U.S. put on were not good, and some of the ram, ramifications of it. But the point that really hit home, where where we the issue is how how do you impact, how do you care, how do you think long term? His example was that one of the things one of the sanctions did was erase, at least for the time, the military to military contact between the Pakistani military and the U.S. military in terms of sending Pakistani officers to U.S. military schools and things like that. And he said it in a much longer way and, and it was very passionate, but the key to that for me was that his final point was that all of the officers of his generation were getting ready to retire. And many of the ones that were moving up were, were had some aspect of the understanding of the U.S. military and those relationships. But the ones that were the junior officers who were going to move up, most of them had absolutely zero contact at that point with U.S. military or what it meant to be a professional soldier and how that aspect plays in a society certainly like ours. Your point about the separation and, and his point, which kind of haunts me every once in a while, was that by not understanding the impact of not having those personal relationships and exchanges that both Pakistan and the United States would pay dearly for that at the end of the day. Because not berating these young officers, but the fact was their only point of reference to the United States tended to be in a mosque where somebody was berating the West and berating, right? And certainly not across the board, but that was his example. Nine days later, we had 9-11. And that has always stayed with me in terms of the importance of that human interaction, you know, whether it's between Pakistan and India, whether it's between us and anybody, right? That, at the end of the day, when you talk about information sharing, however you want to describe it, uh, I think that becomes a key. Okay, I guess we better uh, wrap it up here. Pretty quick. I think uh, it's been a very interesting uh, panel, and thank uh, I want to thank the panelists for their contributions, and and uh, the questions were good too. It seems to me that uh, the first thing you have to do in these kind of situations for mm -hmm. our country and for our allies and friends around the world is uh, is uh, define the enemy. We really haven't done a very uh, good job collectively of that. We can talk about uh, poverty. You can talk about this. You can talk about that. And these are all parts of, of situations in different countries, different regions, different areas and the like. But uh, the challenge is an ideology. And uh, you really need to understand that ideology. You need to understand uh, what that's all about. You need to understand the extremist, uh, extremist fundamentalist views. You need to understand your history. You need to, you need to understand what happened uh, in the world after 700 when uh, Muhammad did what he did and the like. And you need to understand what happened later on and what happened uh, after the Mongol invasion and what happened in 1200 when the first uh, 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 speeches began to be made, the first doctrine was developed uh, uh, that led to this jihadist type of thing you have today. And you have to understand what the, how the Wahhabi uh, people fit into that in the 1700s. You have to understand understand how this was brought back again in, in early 1900 and the like and where we are today and who the five or six or seven key uh, people were that drive this thinking, this thought process and bring this to people. And you need to understand how the, the uh, religious aspects are brought in all the time and we forget that. As far as intelligence is concerned, I, uh, I've never been permitted to sit on any of these panels uh, after something happens because I, uh, I've been too pro-intelligence. I happen to know many of the men and women, civilian and military, and 
all of the major intelligence agencies, and, and, uh, and thank, I thank God every night we have them. They're good people. They're loyal. They do everything they can. They try to follow the law and all of that type of thing, and we ought to be uh, very proud of what they do. It's not intelligence that uh, should be investigated for the failures. It's leadership. In intelligence just provides data and all. It's leaders that have to decide what the hell to do about it. And we forget that. And, and this term, actionable intelligence, when did that start? The 40 years that I fought, that was never a term. I never heard of that. And uh, it's a bunch of malarkey, really. It's just uh, it's, uh, the whole thing. We didn't need a 9-11 commission. All you people should have been uh, laid off, and we should have saved the money. What we need is, uh, is a deliberate attempt to understand what this is all about. And if you confuse, you know, narco-terrorism is different. And it takes a different strategy, a different thought process, and all of that. And so all these kind of things really uh, uh, are, are woven together. And uh, we, uh, we can talk to a blue in the face about all these kind of ideas and like, but until we get smart about this kind of thing and figure out uh, who the enemies and the, and the problem really is all about and how we cooperate, freedom-loving people. Uh, around the world ought to be willing to cooperate. It's not the people that don't cooperate. It's, uh, it's the leadership that doesn't seem to understand what the challenge is. And with that, thank you all for coming. Oh, uh, our latest report on, uh, on the Russian situation, I commend it to you. It's very well done. Thank you all, guys. You bet. Appreciate that.